applying excess of anything to the garden can be hurtful and that includes compost. It's really important to know what our goals are when we are going to be applying compost, why we're applying compost, is it for organic matter, is it for microbial life, is it for a source of fertility? We need to know that going in because that will affect the decisions that we make when it comes to compost application and sourcing. The use of compost is really popular in the garden and for good reason. Composting in the home garden is not only good for the planet because it helps keep things like food scraps and garden scraps out of landfills where they can create methane gas, which is actually a pretty powerful greenhouse gas. It just also helps reduce how much we have to throw out each year. But when we're thinking about using compost in the garden, the first thing that we have to think about is what are our goals? Compost can be used for lots of different things. It can be used to help fertility. It can be used to add organic matter. Some people use it as a mold. Others use it to increase the microbial activity in their soil, and all of those are valid. But before we go using compost, it's good to know what our goals are. Many of us think of compost as being a fertilizer of sorts, and while it can be a fertilizer, it is important to get soils tests before you start annually applying high rates of compost to your soil if you're using it to fertilize your plants. That's because while compost does provide some amount of nitrogen, it also usually comes with phosphorus. High levels of phosphorus in the garden can be problematic, and it's one that often gets overlooked. I often hear people recommending things like applying bone meal, which contains phosphorus, every other week to your plants, which is a really excessive rate of application of phosphorus. And phosphorus is pretty immobile in the soil. So when we're talking about something like nitrogen in the soil, for example, nitrogen is something that's highly volatile. So from week to week in the garden, nitrogen levels can vary. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is pretty immobile. That means that once phosphorus is in your soil, for the most part, it hangs out there and it builds up. So why should we be concerned about excess phosphorus? This is something that I'm talking about a lot in today's compost video. For me, the main concern is the environment. And it has to do with how phosphorus affects waterways specifically, aquatic areas, rivers, streams, oceans. That is that when we have excess phosphorus in the soil, it can leach out. It can absolutely leach from our gardens and down into aquifers. This is exactly what's happened with the dead zone in the Gulf. That was all due to excess phosphorus runoff from farms all along the Mississippi going down and funneling into the Gulf of Mexico and killing off large swaths of aquatic life. It's a really big problem. And it can be the same problem anywhere you are, near rivers, near ponds. Runoff of phosphorus leads to eutrophication. Now, when we're looking at our own personal soil, that is the garden, excess phosphorus, especially if we have alkaline soil like I do here in Colorado, Alkaline soils with a pH of seven or above can really interact with high phosphorus levels and can lead to deficiencies in things like iron and zinc. It can also lead to nutrient imbalances in our plants. High levels of phosphorus can lead to reduced nutrient uptake in our plants, altered microbial activity. So if we have too much phosphorus, especially mycorrhizal fungi are limited in their ability to form associations with plants if phosphorus levels are elevated in the garden. And in some cases, if phosphorus is too high, it can even lead to plant toxicity. It can kill your plants. So excess phosphorus, while it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, can absolutely be a big deal, both for you in your garden and for the ecological footprint of our garden. So what does this have to do with compost? Well, if we're using compost as a source of fertilizer in our garden, that is to provide nitrogen to our plants, which it can do, it's also going to add phosphorus to your soil. Compost is always going to have some level of phosphorus and the amount that it has depends a lot on the inputs. If we're using a compost that has high manure content, or mushroom compost, those can be really high in phosphorus. Where a homemade compost that contains a lot of garden scraps and leaves is going to have lower phosphorus levels, but it will still have some. The problem we're talking about using compost in the garden is most of us don't make enough on a home garden scale to apply at the rate which we've been told we need to apply compost. And to be perfectly honest, I don't agree with a lot of the rates that are recommended. For example, starting a no-dig garden with six inches of compost is pretty excessive in my opinion. Even three inches a year can be too much. A lot of this depends on what is happening in your soil when you're starting out, so just make sure that you grab that soils test. So you can see what the problem is if we are relying on compost as an annual fertilizer. By relying on the compost, we are always adding phosphorus to our soil, and if we're using anything else like bone meal or other supplements or bloom fertilizers, which tend to have high phosphorus levels, we are probably going to run the risk of having 
too high of phosphorus levels. Shockingly, this is a really common problem on no-till farms. They bring in soil basically every year to create a nice plantable layer on top of the soil and also thinking that that is going to improve their soil. Now, in some ways it can by adding organic matter. We'll talk about this next, but in other ways, we risk running too high of phosphorus levels. Most bulk composts are also going to be made with something that are going to be problematic if you're concerned about phosphorus levels. Animal manure is a common compost ingredient because it's cheap. Most farms or feedlots need to get rid of it. They have to push it somewhere. So composting facilities are a great natural fit. So a lot of compost facilities use cow manure, they often use horse manure, and while these can be great sources of nitrogen, they also come with concerns like excess levels of phosphorus, high salts, high nitrates. Those things can actually be really detrimental to your garden, especially in excess. When we're looking at compost that have been made with manure, such as cow or horse, those can often contain herbicide contamination. So because the horses and the cows have been fed with feed that was contaminated with grazon, for example, which is a persistent herbicide, that can stay in the compost for quite a long time. One more serious concern is compost that contain biosolids. Biosolids are also human waste, aka human poop. It became really common in the 80s and 90s for municipalities to think that composting their human waste was a really brilliant use to solve a waste problem. So the solids, the biosolids, also called bio sludge, that come from waste treatment, they need to dispose of those. And so they figured out that if they teamed up with composting facilities who would compost this and then sell it to the public, they thought this was a win-win. However, what they didn't consider was things like medications in people's bodies that don't get broken down by the composting process, things like PFAS or forever chemicals, which we talk about a lot here on my channel. And those have been found to be in biosolids and particularly in composts that are made with biosolids. And again, it's very difficult to know. They don't have to label it. Even bagged soils don't have to put it on the label if there's biosolids. In fact, any bagged soil can be labeled organic. There is zero oversight on using the term organic on bagged soils or compost any soil can say that. What do we want to look for instead? If you have to buy a bagged soil, make sure that it is OMRI certified. By buying an OMRI certified bagged soil or compost, you're going to be able to avoid biosolids. So if you have to buy in, that's what I recommend. But do you even have to buy in and when should you buy in? Now, many of us tend to buy in bagged or bulk compost Homemade is always going to be the best. If you're going to be adding compost, it is important to vet your sources carefully. If you're buying bulk compost, this is especially true because it can be very difficult to know what is in bulk compost when you just buy it at the garden center and it's in a big pile and they deliver a scoop to your house. It's very hard to know. And while most compost facilities should carry a copy of soils test and compost testing on site and make that available to you, it doesn't necessarily mean that that level is the same from batch to batch. So for example, if they tested their compost three months ago, the current compost ingredients could have been completely different and you might not always know what you're going to get. So vet your compost source well. This is why I don't buy in compost anymore because quite frankly, there's too much variation from batch to batch. I really have no idea what I'm getting and I already have high phosphorus levels, so I just don't buy in that much. What we use our compost for is really as a microbial amendment. So that is to help it bolster the soil life. Let's talk about that as a way to use compost next. Now compost and particularly compost containing manure from ruminant animals like our sheep here tends to be really high in microbial activity. That can be a really great thing for the soil. When we're looking at the soil food web and the plants being able to utilize the nutrients that are already there available in the plant profile, the more active our soil life, the better. Why is homemade compost the best? Well, it's pretty simple. So if you think about plant communities, there are plants that thrive in different regions, plants that thrive in hotter areas, more humid areas. The same is true for our microbial soil life. So when we're talking about microbes, fungi that exist within the soil, those can be regional as well. So something that's going to thrive in the soil where my compost is being made might not be the same thing that's going to thrive in my garden in my region. And this is why making our own on site is always going to be better than buying it in because we are able to foster what is native to our area, the native microbes, the native fungi, and all of the things that do well in my climate, in my garden, are going to be able to thrive in my compost pile. And those then are going to be the things that will survive when I go to transplant them into my garden. Compared with if I'm buying in a bagged soil that has 
some fungi or some microbes in it that don't necessarily survive or thrive in my growing climate, those ones aren't going to be as helpful. Now we can absolutely grow and harvest our own mycorrhizal fungi at home. We can brew our own EM1. We can get really pretty complicated with what we can do with our homemade compost, but I do like to keep it pretty simple. And all I do is I apply a little pinch in each planting hole in the spring. That way it's going right into that rhizosphere, the one millimeter around the plant roots where the soil life is the most active. Compare this with, for example, layering it on top of the soil. If we put this on top of the soil with the goal of increasing the microbial life, that's not really going to happen very well because it's going to sit on top. It takes quite a while for these microbes to work their way down into the rhizosphere area. And while it will happen slowly and eventually, just layering it on top is not gonna be the most efficient use of our compost, especially if we're making it at home and we don't have all that much to use. So these are just a couple of the issues that we wanna consider when we're looking at compost. And another one that we wanna think about is when should I be buying and applying my compost, fall or spring? So if you're having to buy in bulk compost, I would usually recommend doing it in the fall. That's because if you're ordering bulk and it's going to have any cow manure, horse manure in it, you want to mitigate any risk of having high nitrates, high salts, and potential herbicide contamination by letting it age over winter. Letting it be exposed to snow, letting it be exposed to rain. It can sit an additional six months before you use it in your garden. That's going to help mitigate any of those risks that can come with bulk compost. But again, always verify that there are no biosolids in your compost because once you have PFAS, forever chemicals in your soil, they don't go away. If on the other hand, you're looking to use your compost as a way to increase your microbial soil life, then that's the case where I recommend applying it in the spring directly to your planting hole or your seed hole, your furrow, wherever it is you're planting. And then you can also use it by brewing a compost tea during the summer, during the growing season and applying that at dusk, not during the heat of the day when you have a lot of UV rays, which can kill microbial life. There are so many considerations when we're talking about compost. It drives me absolutely bonkers when I hear people say, you know, apply two to six inches of compost in your garden every fall. It's just such a blanket statement and every soil is different. It's really best to know what you're starting with. So get it just a, even a, just a basic soils test is going to be helpful in establishing whether you have high phosphorus levels. And if you have those high phosphorus levels in your soil, you may want to avoid using compost. And then there's a better alternative for you in using a nitrogen source that doesn't contain phosphorus. If you're looking to add organic matter, if that is your goal, then yes, compost can be helpful for that as well. But really, I prefer using cover crops. If I'm looking at, organic, at adding organic matter, because if I'm adding organic matter through compost, usually it sits on the top surface of the soil. If I am adding organic matter by growing a cover crop, that cover crop root is actually working its way down and into the soil. It is integrating, it is providing life for the rhizosphere, it's providing the basis of the soil food web so all the fungi and the bacteria are able to feed off of those plant roots. So that is gonna be the best way to add organic matter to your soil is really through adding living plant roots, things like cover crops. We're gonna be talking about that a lot more coming up here in the coming year. And of course, if you haven't checked out our regenerative gardening class, we do talk a lot about cover cropping in that one as well and how you can do it on a home scale. So all in all, compost, yes, it's an amazing thing to do. It can be great for the garden. But be wary when someone tells you to apply six inches of compost at any given time. It can just be too much. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe and we'll be back here soon. Have a great weekend. This can create a lot of issues. So, where is it out? I think I'm sitting in sheep poop.